Hi folks, welcome to the latest roundtable in Avatar's compliance series. Today we'll be talking about what's become one of the thorniest areas of compliance for the private equity world. That is, of course, broker-dealer registration. Uh, I'm Navitar's Nick Donato, and I'll be your moderator today. Shortly, I'm going to introduce you to four of the leading legal experts on this topic who together, I think, can help us solve some of the more tricky issues that this broker-dealer registration challenge is presenting the sector. Uh, but first, why are we here today? What led to today's conversation? Uh, well, we all remember the David Blass speech in 2013. Uh, for the uninitiated, David Blass was this SEC official who began questioning private equity firms that were collecting transaction fees, uh, but they weren't registered as brokers. And what made this so scary is that transaction fees are a pretty regular feature of the private equity business model. So Blass's speech sent a pretty strong ripple effect throughout the industry. And that resulted in a lot of speculation. Lawyers were fielding calls from concerned private equity clients. The trade press, which I was a part of, went on to dissect the ramifications of broker-dealer registration from every angle. Uh, at the time, it felt like what Blast was wondering about openly could eventually become official SEC policy. Then, for the next about three years, nothing really happened. There weren't any more speeches. The SEC wasn't really flagging the issue during its examinations. Uh, there was some speculation that the private equity industry could get a special exemption, uh, but that didn't quite happen either. So people stopped talking about it. It seemed like the issue had lost all its momentum and sort of just died out. Uh, well, at least that's what we thought, because in June, as many of you I'm sure are aware, the SEC rocked the private equity world when it slapped Black Street Capital Management with a $3.1 million settlement for engaging in brokerage activity without registering. So what's going on here? Uh, well, to find out, Navitar assembled some of the best legal minds on the issue to find out. Uh, but before that, some quick housekeeping. The first thing I want to say is that a recording of this webinar will be emailed to everyone, including the slides, after the broadcast is finished. So expect that in your inbox later this week. Uh, secondly, I encourage you to submit any questions using that GoToWebinar tool on your screen there. Uh, I'm, I'm going to reserve some time near the end of our broadcast to relay your questions to our legal panel. Uh, and because I'm not the one who has to answer them, I, I, I say the harder the better. And I promise to preserve your confidentiality. Uh, now, how does Navitar fit into the picture? Well, we are a cloud provider and one that is wholly dedicated to the financial services industry. What we do is provide private equity firms and others the industry's first connected growth platform, which is a way to combine your relationship management, fundraising, deal management, secure document exchange, and certain other workflows together onto one shared system. Uh, the platform is built on top of Salesforce, but it's been customized for your industry. And we have a support team that specializes in private equity and other sectors. So without further ado, uh, let's meet today's roundtable. Uh, Dan, let's start with you. If you could provide our audience uh, the background on you and what makes you a thought leader on our broker-dealer topic. Thank you very much, Nicholas. My name is Dan Byatt. I am uh, of counsel at Dorsey & Whitney. I've been practicing in the broker-dealer regulation space since 1999 and, and uh, spent time at, at FINRA and at several leading law firms. I'll jump in here at Susan Grafton. I'm a partner at Deckert. I began my career in the SEC's Division of Trading and Markets, although that was 1987, so at the time it was market regulation. And uh, since then, I've worked uh, in-house as well as at uh, a number of law firms representing private equity firms as well as broker-dealers and advising on fee structures, fee payments, um, uh, employment agreements, uh, largely to try to avoid the broker-dealer registration issues. And I'm also an active member of the ABA's Trading and Markets Subcommittee, um, where uh, David Blast made the remarks that I guess started the ball rolling. I'll turn it over to Peter. Hi, this is Peter Levang. I'm a partner at Goodwin. Uh, my practice is mainly broker-dealer and securities regulatory, and um, I advise not just existing broker-dealers, but also people who are wondering whether they need to be registered as brokers. Uh, our firm has a strong practice in um, 
uh, private equity funds as well as venture capital, real estate, and hedge funds. So I field a lot of questions in this area on a regular basis. Um, like uh, Susan, I have a background um, with a regulator. In my case, it was the New York State Attorney General's office. And um, I just recently finished a three-year term as the chair of the New York State Bar Association Securities Regulation Committee. And my name is uh, Rick Marshall. I'm a partner in Cat Mutant, Mutant Roachman in their New York office. Uh, many years ago, I worked uh, at the SEC for several years in various capacities. Um, I guess on this particular subject, um, I believe our firm had the first client alert on the Black Street case. It was less than 24 hours after the case was published. Um, I worked very heavily on that. I also wrote an article about the case in the BNA Securities and Commodities Law Reporter, which was critical of the um, ambiguous message, the, the really lack of a message that the case sent. And I counsel private equity firms on these issues um, uh, regularly. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so let's quickly lay out today's agenda. Uh, four main themes that I want to touch upon. Uh, First, we want to get an understanding of how the SEC approaches this issue today and how that might change following next week's election. Uh, we also want to give firms a sense of what the main red flags are when it comes to figuring out whether they should register. And then, of course, once we give firms a sense of that, uh, what that compliance path looks like moving forward. Um, lastly, as I mentioned, I'm going to reserve some time at the end here to broadcast some audience questions. Um, okay, so let's begin. Uh, I want to start by gauging all of your reactions to something that we heard when the Black Street Settlement uh, case was announced. Uh, an SEC official said in their press release, and I quote here, uh, the rules are clear. Before a firm provides brokerage services and receives compensation in return, it must be properly registered with the regulatory framework that protects investors and informs our markets which to me make, is a pretty strong statement um, that the rules are clear. Do you guys agree? What are your thoughts? This is where the transcript would indicate laughter because um, <laughs> I, I, I don't um, think that they're all at all clear and, and they're not clear for a, for a large number of reasons. You know, one of the reasons is that we're not exactly sure Blackstreet Capital did not identify the particular fees um, that they were uh, saying were brokerage fees. The, the order is sufficient in, in that it doesn't uh, talk about that. Um, in addition, Blackstreet Capital didn't talk about whether or not they, they should have been able to use the, the M&A broker uh, um, exemption letter, which we can talk about later. Um, but I, th I think that there are a lot of uh, open issues that need to be talked about before we really understand what that case means. And I, I think also because it's a you know it's a negotiated settlement, and when you, you ever have that, there are a lot of factors behind the scene that somehow result in a case that now we're all looking to for the law. But it also could be just the result of negotiations between the uh, respondent and the SEC. And I think uh, I think that was Peter. In addition to um, his points, you know, I think also there was disclosure that sounded very clearly that they, they provided services that looked were almost explicitly like a broker dealer services. So that's that's a bad fact that you don't normally have in uh, with most private equity firms. The the article I wrote was called The Perils of Regulation by Prosecution. And my point was that Trying to develop the law by bringing settled enforcement cases is a terrible way to give guidance to people on what they can and can't do. And we're gonna, we've heard some reasons for that um, and why the Black Street case is not clear. We're probably going to hear more of that. Um, we don't know exactly what makes uh, the compensation that's received transaction-based compensation. We don't know exactly what activities um, a private equity firm can engage in that cause it to need a broker-dealer licenses. And in fact, a lot of what private equity firms do, which is to acquire a company, manage it, and then ultimately sell it, is an advisory function, not a brokerage function. And it's not exactly clear which of those activities sort of goes over the line. So 
I think that it's um, it's very unfortunate that the SEC views this kind of a settled enforcement case as a way to make clear um, uh, clear law. It does not do that. And now, now would, would it be likely that the SEC does come out with some more industry-specific guidance to offer this clarity, or is the more likely outcome that they continue using enforcement cases to make their points? I think it depends on the leadership. We're, we're going to talk about the election. Um, the current leadership at the SEC has focused more on using enforcement actions to clarify the standards. And we, we're we not talking about here today, but we could talk about the whistleblower area where they're doing it by uh, case. Um, there are other areas, and um, I think it just depends on the direction that the new leadership wants to wants to take people. I don't think that people in the private equity industry are going to willfully violate the law. If they're given clear guidance, they'll follow it. The problem is they don't have clear guidance. Let's let's yeah, let's I, talk I about the election then. Well, well I, was, I was also going to say that. I, I, Go ahead. I was also going to say, just to go back to that point, I mean, I think that to some extent the staff, you know, believes that there is guidance out there. I'm, I'm not agreeing with that point, but I think to a large extent they believe that there is guidance. There's, you know, a whole litany of cases and no action letters to, to define, you know, he, who does have to register as a broker-dealer. So I do think that to a large extent um, they feel like that the, the law is clear and, you know, everybody needs to figure it out. But uh, that it, as Rick said, I mean, I think, you know, some of this might, uh, we might, maybe we'll get more guidance depending on the election. I'll segue back to you. Yeah, I was just going to add, Nick, that uh, a lot of us in the you know the broker dealer community have have been um, talking to the SEC uh, on and off about whether we could get a no action letter or some kind of guidance. And one of the responses that we've gotten from them is, I mean, it's discouraging. It's basically be careful what you ask for because you might not like the answer. So there's been a um, disinclination to try to push the SEC at this point to to come out with further guidance. And as we're waiting for that guidance or, or whether or not that answer is going to be something that the industry may like, uh, to Richard's point, it seems like some of this will depend on who the country elects uh, next week. Um, let's talk about that. Uh, where does this issue go if uh, we – let's start with the Trump administration. Uh, what may happen if uh, Donald Trump wins, wins the White House on the broker-dealer question? Yeah, I mean, well, look, the, the statistical models right now indicate that Mr. Trump has a, a you know, likelihood of somewhere between 5 and 15 percent of winning the election. But, but it seems clear that if he actually won the election, it, it's highly likely that, that he would also get both houses, right? He'd have the Senate and um, the House of Representatives uh, on his side. On the other hand, he's also been at war with Republicans right now, so it's not clear who is going to want to serve in his administration and how well he's going to cooperate with people. But um, you know, there's there's a there's a likelihood that, of course, there there are going to be more um, uh, conservatives in his administration. Um, but the SEC and, and Susan may be able to speak to this and, and Rick, but the SEC over the years, even in conservative administrations, has tended to um, you know, be highly investor protection minded. So, so it's not clear that change would come from the agency. It might have to come from legislation. And it might also depend on, you know, to the extent that there is there are more initiatives, uh, like we've seen with the Jobs Act and crowdfunding, and those. Uh, those types of initiatives that might look at some of these broker-dealer registration issues as barriers to entry and impediments in, in terms of, um, you know, raising raising money. I mean, that, that to me seems the most likely scenario if Trump were to win, where we might see some some guidance and relief. Uh, but again, I think um, you know it is viewed as an independent, uh, you know, uh, agency that's charged with investor. Protection. So, whether or not it would be pushed pushed to act, and whether it would act quickly, is a, is an open issue. It's an open issue, but I think you could say you could agree, to, uh, or I I could see that that any commissioners appointed by Mr. Trump would be um, likely more business friendly than than those appointed by a Democratic administration. Mm -hmm. 
I think that it, it's actually more more interesting to look at it from the other perspective because, as one of the speakers point out, it's unfortunately not likely that um, you know that there's you know, it's, it's well, whether it's unfortunate or not. I guess I mean, it looks like Hillary Clinton is going to win. Um, to me, the most unfortunate aspect of the lead up to that is the Elizabeth Warren letter to President Obama asking him to fire Mary Jo White as chairman. Um, that, I think, is virtually unprecedented, and it signals that within the Democratic Party there is going to be, which Elizabeth Warren has been very explicitly saying, a push for a much more uh, industry-hostile pro-enforcement SEC than what we have now. Um, if President Obama did fire Mary Jo White, I guess Kara Stein would be the new chairman, she is, I guess, um, I've been told, a friend of Elizabeth Warren, and perhaps the signal was that what we want to have are um, highly politicized liberals who don't uh, have any um, particularly des particular desire to work with the business community, who are in fact very hostile to the business community, and I think that direction might actually make things far worse. And, and and I was absolutely uh, astonished to read a story that I read this morning um, that was in Bloomberg that basically said that both parties had asked her, you know, had indicated that like they would like her to stay on at least for an interim period. So you know, I I, I think that all just <laughs> emphasizes that this is just completely up in the air. Which which takes us back to another point that despite some SEC officials saying that. The rules are clear. Uh, they are clearly not, and this is going to change even further, depending on who does win that election. Um, so let, let's get into some of the uh, specifics here then about how people can identify what the red red flags would be as they're operating in this uh, compliance haze, we can call it. Um, one of the SEC's concerns is around the sale of private fund interest by investor relations staff. Uh, when, in your view, does this become a compliance risk? This well, is this nothing is, new. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, you're right. It's nothing new, and and there's there's actually a, a a safe harbor rule that people always use. It's a touchdown three a four one, which is sometimes called the uh, um, the issuer exemption, although it's an exemption for employees and officers of the issuer. Um, but but there are some key things that are are. Um, that are important in that rule. One of those things is that the people who are selling interests have to have substantial other duties besides simply marketing. And the other one is that they can't be paid special compensation for marketing. So, you know, questions always arise as to whether somebody can get a, a bonus and if the bonus can be based on how much they bring in. And I, I think, um, you know, generally practitioners say, look, a bonus is okay if it's based on the person's overall performance, not just marketing, and taking into account how well the, the firm or the enterprise is doing. Um, on the issue of uh, substantial other duties, a very hard question that practitioners have to answer is, well, what if those duties are, are investor relations? You know, there are some companies for whom investor relations is a legitimate and important uh, role, and other places where investor relations is just another aspect of marketing. So that's a problematic issue. But when I say this is not new, this is not an issue that's unique to private equity, and it's been around for a long time. When a hedge fund tries to raise money, it faces this issue. If you think about it, the interests in the private equity fund, the hedge fund, are securities. And so are you affecting transactions and securities to the account of others? And that is an issue that has been well developed both through 3A4-1 and a line of no action letters, which are sort of commonly known as the finders no action letters. And uh, there are there there are permissible activities that can be engaged in without the need for a broker's license. But I think the two touchstones are number one that there not be by the individual. Uh, the receipt of transaction-based compensation, and number two, that the frequency and extensiveness of the activity in the sales effort be limited. 
it would not be something the person does all the time as their sole activity, and they wouldn't go out and basically do hard sell sale pitches and then help the person fill out the documentation and you know close the deal. So um, there there is well developed law in this area, but um, it's not unique to private equity. I believe they brought a case against a firm about three years ago for um, selling interests and not having a broker's license. I think that was in the private equity space and that did attract a lot of attention. Um, the good news for private equity is that they tend to do a new fund not all the time but every once in a while. There are some very, very large firms that might be constantly offering a new fund but for most private equity firms they're not offering a new fund every day of the week. So there is a possibility of structuring either under 384-1 or the finders no action letters to avoid registration if you're prepared not to pay transaction-based compensation to the sales fund. That's right. And then and then if you do want to pay transaction-based compensation to a sales force, then you have to look into the possibility of creating a broker dealer, a captive broker dealer, and and registering all the salespersons. Well, or you, or you could enter into an arrangement with uh, a firm that basically will provide all the broker dealer supervisory and compliance functions to the sales force, and so the sales team would be dual hatted and. The, re the broker dealer registration issues would be uh, taken would uh, be taken care of through this other entity. That's right. Uh, I, I wonder too if if you were to have a captive group, how what kind of operational and logistical challenges does that present? Whether it's the chain of command, whether it's job titles, whether it's the employment agreement, is that a is that a uh, a big undertaking? I mean a dedicated sales force within your firm? No, I, I meant if, you, if you're registering some sole individuals or having a captive broker oh, team sorry. within the firm. Well, from the sorry. from the from the broker dealer perspective, they would all be registered with that, you know, third party broker dealer who would be responsible for supervising them, and would they have the authority to hire, fire, set compensation, etc. But only with respect to the broker dealer. So they could say, look, I don't want Joe to work with me anymore at this broker-dealer, you know, and then it would be up to the private equity firm to decide whether they wanted to keep them on if they were thinking of that. If that was your question from sort of the um, reporting uh, reporting lines. And so, you know, there could be two different uh, sort of streams of compensation, one that would be determined with respect to the sales activities and one would be determined with respect to any other activities. It was, right. Yeah, and, and then, yeah. oh, go ahead. Uh, for a third party, for a captive broker-dealer, I think the compliance challenges are, are uh, similar but different in a way because you, because uh, the private equity or hedge fund uh, it would be directly responsible for, for compliance uh, with their captive broker-dealer. Right, and I think one of the challenges you often see there is that you have sometimes like a, a more junior person who's put in charge of the broker-dealer functions if you're going to have a captured broker-dealer and so how do you uh, enforce the supervisory you know chain of control uh, and make it look like the the folks who have the reg, you know regulatory risk at the broker-dealer really have the supervisory responsibility versus say the more senior people who are just performing the private equity functions uh, that's right. I mean, Nick, we're going to, I think we were going to talk about registering a broker dealer uh, a little bit later, but, but the fact is that, that when people are thinking about this process, they can't simply think about it as, you know, going through the registration process and then they have a broker. The, it, ongoing compliance is a real burden. Um, and it's something that has to be taken seriously because there are compliance risks that arise if you get examined by the SEC or FINRA or somebody else and, and they find deficiencies. It's, it's just another thing to worry about on, on a regular basis and to pay people to take care of. 
And well, I know we're going to be talking about having a having a registered captive broker dealer. If you have your individuals licensed at an independent third party broker dealer, which is perfectly legal, so you have salesmen who work for you, but they're also registered reps of a completely independent firm that's a registered broker dealer. In that context, I find that there's a few issues that the private equity firm has that make them resist it. One is it costs money. Um, part of the uh, part of the uh, uh, compensation has to be paid to that independent third party. Number two, there's a loss of control. Uh, you know that that broker dealer sometimes says, "No, you can't do this. Uh, I don't like this issue. You know, I don't like the way you're handling this." That that is something people are bothered with. There's also, frankly, sometimes a difficulty in finding the right firm. Uh, if you're marketing to world-class institutions, you want to have people who are licensed at a world-class institution. And frankly, the firms that will carry the licenses um, have become more reluctant to, to just take that on. So um, it can sometimes be difficult to find a place for your people to get licensed that you view as being consistent with the way you want to present your firm to the world. So. Those are the three issues that I see with that formula, but it, it works as a legal matter. And, and now, too, uh, determining uh, whether or not that group should be captive or, or who should be registered, of course, comes down to what types of fees you're charging. So I want to shift the conversation to that. Um, one of the things that we hear or some of the speculation is that uh, fee offsets are one potential escape route. And you'll see that I've listed a number of different types of fees that may trigger some compliance red flags. Um, but let's, let's, let's begin with, with fee offsets. Is, is this an escape route? <laughs> All right. So the, the, the fee offset issue is, is this, right? Um, if, if the question is whether you're acting as a broker or dealer, and those, those are two different things, by the way. So, so if, if um, if the fund is engaging in a transaction on its own behalf, it, it might arguably uh, be a dealer, um, or it might be acting on it, you know, it, for its own investment account and not a dealer at all. So the argument is that when the, the general partner or the manager of that fund does something on its behalf, it's not acting as a broker, at that i.e., an intermediary. It's acting as the people who, person who actually runs the other party to a transaction. So if, if the um, manager in that case gets a fee but offsets the fee 100% to the fund, then an argument could be made that it is the fund that's receiving the fee and not the manager, and therefore the manager is not being paid compensation for being a broker. So now issues come up about, about offset. You know, one of the issues being, um, you know, does the offset have to be 100%? And another issue being, like, what happens if the, the fees that are owed um, don't equal the, the, the fees that you're getting uh, for acting as a, as a um, you know, an intermediary? Uh, you know, what do you do about those situations? Yeah, I, I laugh because David Blass in that speech from 2013 said that if there was, I guess, 100 percent offset, uh, that he would view that as taking the broker-dealer issue away. The reasoning appeared to be that there would no, there would be no receipt of transaction-based compensation. Basically, it would, it would just simply uh, money would would be you'd be entitled to money, but it would cause you to receive less of typically uh, your advisory fee. So therefore, net net, you would not have any money coming in. Um, that's all that we really have from the SEC is one sentence in a in a speech from three and a half years ago, and um, people debate this issue. And of course, there is the complexity of what if it's less than 100% offset? Um, does that mean that it doesn't really count? <laughs> we don't know. Yeah, and, and offsetting fees can be problematic for other reasons too. There's a there's another um, case that the uh, SEC brought against W. L. Ross and Company, and in that situation, what was happening is that there were um, more than one fund that had an investment in a portfolio company, uh, and there were also like uh, 
other investors besides the funds. And what happened there was that uh, the SEC didn't like the way that um, that the manager was offsetting fees with respect to the to the funds because it felt that it had used a methodology that resulted in their getting more money than they should have gotten. So you have to be careful about the offset, especially if there are multiple parties involved. It, it, and we mentioned too the risk that you may be charging uh, transaction fees that surpass your management fee totals to be offset. And, and let's just, for the sake of argument, say that you are doing it at the 100% rate. Um, whether or not we have enough clarity on what happens next. Well, I guess I mean the problem that point points to is if there's not if you if you earn a fee that's larger than 100% of the offset of some other fee, you are in fact making money. You're just making less than you would without the offset. And then the question is, is making a small amount of transaction-based compensation okay? Then you're not acting as a broker. Whereas making a big fee makes you a broker. It's there's no law on that at all that I'm aware of. That, that, that's right. I, I think I, I think it's a mistake to think that the uh, SEC might might uh, respect a kind of a de minimis analysis. And and uh, just to use an analogous um, point in the Black Street Capital case, you know, a lot of the assets that were being bought and sold were actually not even securities. When they actually did the analysis, I I'm told by people who worked on the case that there were only three transactions that involved securities. So they hoped that that the SEC would conclude, well, you you know, you were you were good most of the time, and there were only three transactions that involved securities. But the SEC didn't take that point position, so I I, I think that uh, you can't count on um, the fact that uh, you've offset most of the fees, but not all of them, as being a defense. I don't think you could be a little bit pregnant in this case. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I put up some fees here uh, on the screen that uh, could potentially be troublesome from uh, the broker-dealer question. Um, we can cherry pick which fees we want to we want to uh, discuss because I'm being conscious of time here. Uh, but I definitely want to discuss monitoring fees and about when or where this would become an issue. Uh, I, I guess fees. I can go ahead. I would, I'm going to make the simple statement that monitoring fees um, become a problem when you accelerate them. You accelerate them in circumstances where you're supposed to be monitoring a, um, a portfolio company, for example, over a period of 10 years, but it gets sold or it has an IPO uh, prior to the end of that period, and there, there's an acceleration so that you're getting the monitoring fees that you would have gotten for the last three years right to the front. I mean, or, I, in or, my or, view, I was say, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, or somehow you sort of convert the monitoring fee into something that looks more transaction based, which would go again to the acceleration point, but it's somehow you know geared to the disposition of a portfolio company. I mean, in my view, a monitoring fee, a, tr a simple monitoring fee, is not um, transaction-based compensation, and it's not a fee for an activity that would normally be treated as one that would require broker registration. It wouldn't be affecting transactions and securities, either for your own account or for the account of others. The whole issue of accelerated monitoring fees, you know, you enter into a 10-year contract with a portfolio company, and the contract provides that if the company is disposed of before the 10 years, the, all, the full 10-year fees have to be paid to the private equity firm at the time of closing. So let's suppose you have a 10-year contract and after five years the company is sold, so the private equity firm gets five years of monitoring fees, but they're not doing any monitoring. And that uh, payment is triggered by the fact that the company is sold. Um, there is absolutely no law on this. Um, in some ways, it has an appearance of transaction-based compensation, but what is the activity? I think you would also have to have some activity that would be traditionally associated with affecting transactions and securities 
Typically, the private equity firm is involved in the disposition of the company, but are they acting as an advisor? Are they acting as a broker? What exactly are they doing? There has never been an enforcement case on this, and it, it, I, there have been plenty of enforcement cases about accelerated monitoring fees, but not saying that it required broker-dealer registration. And um, this is an intellectually interesting question, but I don't know of any guidance from the SEC that would say that you get an accelerated monitoring fee, you need a broker's license. But this is a good opportunity to talk about what the SEC would look for and, and how um, fund managers can protect themselves. Because what the SEC is going to be asking um, is what is the fee for, what is the activity for which you're being paid, and if it were an arm's length contract, would somebody else pay you this to do what you are doing? Um, it's it's not enough to, to call things something that that don't look suspicious, right? Or, or that that are ordinarily seen in other um, uh, 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 contexts, like an advisory fee or a monitoring fee. Um, the, the SEC will look beyond the name and they'll ask what what actually is going on and why are you being paid. You don't seem to be doing any kind of portfolio monitoring. What you really seem to be doing is introducing uh, people so that they can have transactions. That's that's where the the problem lies, and that's that's how fund managers can protect themselves by being very careful to understand what the fee is for and and um, that it's for an activity that they can conduct with the licenses that they have. I, I wonder too, given the uh, current uh, uh, noise on the on the issue from the Black Street case, if even if there has not been a prior case or, or prior guidance on it, that you may start seeing something like uh, structuring fees resulting from a club deal uh, start coming under scrutiny because the examiners are, are are taking orders from the top, or they are equally aware of all the noise around it and are are, are taking a, a closer look or a more skeptical eye on these fees. Well, one of the confusions here is after the blast speech in 2013, there were scores of private equity firms who had inspections and were asked to explain to the SEC why they were not registered as a broker-dealer. And it, it was the, the finders issue, the fundraising issue, it was also the deal fee issue. And firms uniformly put in letters saying that they didn't think they needed to be a broker-dealer for reasons A, B, C, D, E, and nothing happened. And so, I mean, the SEC has been sensitive to this issue for years, but what we have is one enforcement case. So, I want to pivot the conversation towards another recent development uh, that may offer firms some relief on this matter. Uh, in, in August, the SEC approved a FINRA proposal for creating a, a separate set of rules for broker-dealers that must meet the definition of a capital acquisition broker or, or a CAB. Uh, is this something for private equity firms to feel excited about? Well, they, they, they still have to, it doesn't get them out of registering as a broker-dealer, but it does help them in terms of the, the burdens of being a broker-dealer. So I think that it, to the extent they have you know, resigned themselves to needing to be a broker-dealer, it certainly um, is less onerous than the full-fledged uh, broker-dealer registration. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, the, the jury's still out on the capital acquisition broker. The, the, um, the timing is that the rules will go effective in April of 2017, and um, you can start applying as early as something like January 3rd of 2017 if you want to be a capital acquisition broker, or if you're a regular FINRA member firm, by the way, you can switch over to being a CAB easily. But the, they're, they're restricted to two main activities. One is... Um, private placements to institutional investors, which, you know, fortunately also includes um, qualified participants, which is the kind of people who go into 3C7 funds. Um, and then the second thing that you, you can do is M&A transactions. Um, and then you can, you, you can engage in various kinds of uh, investment banking activities, advisory activities around those two things. 
but there are also limitations so that you're not going to you're not supposed to be able to do secondary transactions um, and sometimes it's helpful for somebody who's associated with a fund to be able to help an investor to get out and sell to somebody else but that at the moment is a restriction um, but the you're, you're still going to have to comply with uh, SEC rules because there's been no change in those. And also FinCEN, which, you know, uh, controls AML um, processes. Uh, it's, it, there are a few things about the um, FINRA CAB rules which are really helpful, one of which is that there's going to be um, a, a much easier suitability standard. Another one is that the, the communications rule has been shortened down to a few conduct rules so that you don't have to do um, filings with FINRA, advertising material, and so forth. And, and in the communications rule, you will be able to do something that regular FINRA members can't do, and that is to provide forecasts, reasonable forecasts and projections with respect to offerings. Um, so, you know, we'll. PE firms could open a um, CAB uh, as an affiliate uh, and use it to number one sell interest in their funds and number two um, to engage in M&A transactions on you know with portfolio companies and assets and and receive <laughs> transaction based compensation which you know is a that's like right. the I guess the the reward at the end of all of this hassle. But I mean I think I would think that some of these requirements that you mentioned, like FinCEN requirements, you know, a lot of in a lot in many cases, you know, I think uh the farmers would want to do those, um, even without the cab requirements. Mm -hmm. This might be a good time to talk about why do private equity firms resist registering as a broker dealer? Do we want to shift to that for a second? We do, and, and the way that, I, that we've broken this down then is that there seem to be three options. You can remain unregistered, uh, but potentially rely on the M&A broker exemption that we discussed. Um, there's, of course, the option of registering, which uh, a percentage of private equity firms have done. Uh, and then there is this uh, CAB option that we're talking about. Uh, and, and to your point, Richard, yes, if we could shift into the pros and cons, and what are some of the main areas that a private equity, say, compliance officer needs to be looking at to help them determine which of these three paths is right for their firm. And, and just to put a fourth option on the table, we talked about it earlier, having a few individuals at the firm become registered representatives of an independent third-party broker-dealer. I think that's a fourth option. Yeah. It, it is, yes. So then, those, those main areas that you think a CCO should be looking at when they're evaluating their three options, or to, if, if they're going to pursue that fourth option, uh, we've already discussed there too about what it might mean logistically. Uh, what, are some, what are some broad level guidance that you can provide to give, to give firms a sense of direction here? Well, I mean, I, I, I go ahead. Yeah, the, 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 I was just going to say something from the business point of view that that um, registering as a broker it could be extremely valuable. Um, obviously, you know there are some very um, you know uh, um, successful companies that are brokers, without a doubt. But but if you're a PE firm and what you want to be able to do is to have a few individuals marketing uh, your fund once a year or a couple of times a year. And you also might want to get some kind of um, uh, fees, you know, M&A type fees. Um, it may be that the cost of registering as a broker or a CAB just isn't, um, uh, it, it's just too high relative to uh, the benefits of, of registration. Um, so there's going to be a lot of uh, um, PE funds that may decide that remaining unregistered but being careful about how they conduct their business is going to be superior. But if, on the other hand, you've got a much larger organization um, and you can use your broker-dealer in, in several ways um, and, and there are a lot of opportunities to make fees available to you, then I, I think you should consider the process. I mean, I, my experience is that many private equity firms resist registration. Some of the very largest ones are registering, but many firms still resist. 
I think that um, we've talked about the fact that it is expensive and time-consuming to get through the registration process, particularly the FINRA piece. It is um, a not inconsequential cost of maintaining the broker-dealer, uh, annual audits, periodic filings, uh, this, that, and the other thing. I find that firms are very concerned about the frequency of inspections. Um, you know, FINRA inspects firms very frequently, whereas the SEC inspects advisors relatively infrequently. There's a concern that FINRA, when they find minor technical problems, tends to bring an enforcement action. And although the penalties may not be as severe as with the SEC, that is something that firms are concerned about, a little sort of a technical footfall that ends up on their record. Frankly, there's also a concern about licensing of individuals. On the advisor side, um, because, uh, there is the state licensing investment advisor rep thing, but most private equity firms can avoid that for a number of reasons. But in the broker-dealer side, people will have to get licenses, which means they'll have to get fingerprinted, they'll have to take an exam, They'll have to maintain a Form U4, which discloses a lot of information, is it available now on the Internet, and there's a lot of concern about that regime. So there is, there is resistance um, by private equity firms. And I think that, and I agree absolutely with all of those. I think there also, though, when folks are weighing the decision and the idea of having the third party that we've discussed, there are concerns about having, you know, the information sharing that would happen with those third parties if you're going to have your individual employees licensed through that broker dealer. Uh, and sometimes I think there's concern that investors might not want their information shared with that third party. So in our final minutes here, I'm going to shift this over to audience questions. And one of the first questions that I'm reading has to do with compliance monitoring. And I'm going to take some leeway in paraphrasing this question a little bit differently than it's written, because it's a question that a number of Navitar clients have directed our way. And it's about using a system to, to monitor who's talking to prospective investors. Who's sending out uh, diligence materials? Uh, who had a meeting? Who might be in any type of business that may give the appearance of affecting a transaction and, and triggering these broker-dealer compliance concerns? Uh, so the question to the panel here would be, are, are, are firms uh, taking a risk if they don't have a system in place to monitor who's sending out the PPM of who's met with a number of investors uh, uh, per quarter, or whatever it may be? I mean, I certainly think that firms have to monitor their marketing efforts, whether they're doing it through a registered broker-dealer or not, because they have to worry about anti-fraud, they have to worry about the Securities Act of 1933, they have to worry about state notice filing. Uh, we haven't even talked about state registration, but, you know, if you're selling securities, you have to worry about whether some state is going to require an individual to get a license in that state. So somebody who would go out and raise money, this sounds like more like the fundraising, without keeping a close eye on who's doing what and what legal issues are raised by that, I think that would, that would be very unwise. I agree. We have a question here coming in that's related to fees. Uh, if an advisor to a PE firm receives fees that are contingent on the closing of the transaction, might that raise questions uh, at the SEC? It, it does because that sends us back to the whole issue of transaction-based compensation. So if the idea is that they're performing services in connection, let's say, with a sale of a portfolio company, some other event that is a securities transaction, and the fee is contingent on that closing of that transaction, then that does raise the issue of um, broker-dealer registration. We have another question related to fees here. This one for uh, credit managers, debt investment firms. Would arranging and syndicating uh, private loans for a borrower uh, and say one to three other lenders uh, where the borrower pays the investment manager based on the size of the deal, might that require broker-dealer registration? Well, the whole issue of loans is interesting because um, the, the loans can be either they can they can be securities or not securities. There's a whole um, 
uh, Supreme Court case Reeves uh, and and cases that have um, come out under Reeves. But what they do is it's it's not like the Howey test where you talk about um, you know participation, interest, and securities. This is this is a family resemblance test. Does something look more like a loan, or does it mo look more like you're you're um, selling securities? And it looks more like a loan if, for example, you have um, sophisticated institutions that are in the you know usually in the business of lending, um, and that can include you know hedge funds and BDCs that lend um, and. Uh, are the are the loans being syndicated in a way that they're reasonably you know likely to end up in the hands of other sophisticated people, or are they broken up into pieces that could be sold to the public? And finally, there there is some looking at whether there's a, an alternative regulatory structure, but you know that's not always decisive. But the fact is that uh, loans can be either, and and you have to be very careful to make sure that you're not just uh, syndicating out loans to, for example, individual investors, because that could look more like a security. Another question coming in related to fees. Uh, this has been a, a fee really under the microscope of the SEC, dead deal expenses. Uh, someone is asking for the roundtable's thoughts on uh, uh, broken deal expenses. I mean, I guess I can speak to that. I mean, that was one of the issues in one of the enforcement cases. How do you allocate the broken dealer expenses? In that case, the allegation was that they were not uh, the broken deal broken deal expenses were not borne in a manner that was consistent with disclosures, and therefore it raised anti-fraud concerns. Um, there was no question raised about whether or not the, the broken dealer fees required um, expenses required broker dealer registration. Normally the case, you know, when you talk about transaction based compensation, you're talking about revenue, not expenses. Normally bearing expenses and in a broken deal deal, I guess you, you pay money and nothing happens. Um, you, you know, you incur expenses and then there's no transaction. Normally that would not be viewed as transaction based compensation. And the one case that, that we have that talked about how how those expenses were borne did not deal with the issue of broker dealer licensing. So I would say that's probably not a high risk area. We have time for one last question, and this is this is going to be a difficult one. Um, we have someone asking that they often see uh, third party advisors. Um, who receive a transaction fee plus a carried interest allocation, um, but it's structured through an intermediate entity between the portfolio company and between the PE fund. And doesn't it seem that such deal brokers need uh, one or both of broker dealer or, or SEC registration exemptions? Have you seen this in your practice, that intermediate vehicle? Well, I mean, it's not so much the intermediate vehicle point, but it's just what is the advisor getting a fee for, right? So, so there, there are advisors who, um, you know, are legitimately advising with respect to the uh, the assets or portfolio companies, and then there are other advisors whose value added is that they're bringing in investors, and if if what you're doing, um, or if if they're uh, introducing two parties who are going to, you know, like a, like a buyer of, a, of an asset and a seller of an asset. If that's what they're doing, just making an introduction or bringing in investors, then then it it, it does look like um, a brokerage transaction. Right. You know, in, in tax law and corporate law, frequently you can create structures where you have some entity that sort of you know, one entity gets the fee and another entity performs a service and you don't collapse the two. Under the federal securities laws, that generally doesn't work. Each of the federal securities laws says basically you can't do indirectly what you couldn't do directly. So creating different shell companies and having one company get the fee and another company do the work normally does not help you. You really have to look at the substance, the economic substance of what's going on. Well, that is all the time that we do have today. Um, there are a number of other questions coming in, but you'll see their contact information for all five of us if you'd like to follow up with any of the points that you heard here today. Uh, I want to thank the roundtable uh, for their valuable thought leadership. Uh, as mentioned at the start of the webinar, uh, a copy of today's recording will be made available in the coming day or two. So on behalf of Navitar, uh, I'm Nick Donato. Enjoy your day.